and amen. Church, worship with us this morning. We worship the God who was. We worship the God who is. We worship the God who evermore will be. Oh, yes. He opened the prison doors. He parted the raging sea. My God, He holds the victory. Yes. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. Oh, oh, we shout out your praise. Oh, yes. We sing. We sing to the God who heals. We sing to the God who saves. We sing to the God who always makes a way. Cause he hung up on that cross, then he rose up from that grave. My God, still rolling stones away. Hey, there's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. And we won't be quiet. We shout out. Shout out your praise, oh yes we do, oh see we were the beggars and now we're royalty, we were the prisoners, oh and now we're running free, we are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by his grace, let the house of the Lord sing praise, oh yes we were the beggars. Oh, and now we're royalty, and we were the prisoners, and now we're running free. Oh, we are forgiven, accepted, redeemed by His grace. Let the house of the Lord sing praise. Sing it to a church. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Oh, yes, there's joy in the house of the Lord today. Oh, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. Our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. Oh, and we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise. There's joy in the house of the Lord. And our God is surely in this place. And we won't be quiet. We shout out your praise, oh yes, oh, 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 we shout out your praise, oh yes, we do, Lord, there's joy in the house of the Lord today, oh, oh, oh. we shout out your praise, we shout out your praise, oh yes, we do, Lord, he's worthy, amen, oh yes, we praise you, Lord. Let's just continue that church. Oh, yes. Oh. Praise you, Lord. Let praise be a weapon that silences the enemy. Let praise be a weapon that conquers all. Oh, let it rise. 
of all our praise. Amen, church. He's so worthy, Lord. You are so worthy of all of our praise and so much more. We're so grateful that we get to speak the name of Jesus in this room this morning. It's all to you, Lord. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. That is who you are, Lord. That is who you are. We are here to sing praises unto you, to declare the truth of who you are. Your name is power, Lord. That is who you are. That is who you are. We worship you all together this morning, Lord, because you are worthy of it all and so much more. We give you all the praise, Lord, all the praise this morning. I just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind. Oh, yes, Lord, because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Just wanna speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to break. Oh yes. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. Oh yes, we do, Lord, cause your name is power. And your name is healing, oh yes, your name is life, oh yes, Lord, you break every stronghold, you shine through the shadows, you burn like a fire, oh yes, oh and I just want to speak the name Jesus, oh, over fear and all anxiety, oh yes, to every soul held captive by depression, oh, I speak Jesus, oh, cause your name is power and your name is healing, yes, Lord. shine through the shadows you burn like 
That's who you are. That's who you are. You shine light in the darkness, Lord. You shine light in the darkness, Lord. Oh, yes. That's who you are. That's who you are. Let's do church. Shout Jesus from the mountains and Jesus in the streets. Yes, Lord. Jesus in the darkness over every enemy. Oh yes, Jesus for my family. Oh, I speak the holy name oh, of Jesus. Oh, we shout Jesus from the mountains. Oh, and Jesus in the streets. Yes, Lord, Jesus in the darkness. So. Jesus, come on church, shout Jesus from the mountains, we shout Jesus from the mountains, oh and Jesus in the streets, yes Lord, Jesus in the dark, it's over every enemy, oh and Jesus for my family, I speak the holy name of Jesus. speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind oh yes Lord oh cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus oh yes Jesus in this place Jesus in this room, oh, I speak Jesus over you this morning, Jesus, 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 oh yes, sing your name is power, your name is power, Lord, your name is, oh yes it is, your name is love. about the name of Jesus, oh, oh, I speak Jesus in this place over you, oh, I speak Jesus in 
Jesus, no one like you, Lord, but Jesus, he's our healer, Jesus, he's provider, and he has power, he's Jesus, oh, that's who you are, my Jesus, Jesus. Something about the name Jesus, oh yes, cause your name is power, Lord your name is healing, and your name is life, yes it is Lord, you break every stronghold, you shine through the shadows in the dark, burn a fire. Come on, church, just one more time. Sing your name is power, and your name is power, and your name is healing, Lord. Your name is life. Yes, Lord, you break every stronghold. Yes, shine through the shadows, burn like a fire. just want to speak the name of Jesus over every heart and every mind, yes, Lord. Oh, because I know there is peace within your presence. I speak Jesus. Jesus, 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 speak Jesus, Jesus, Jesus over you, over every mind, over every heart this morning, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus over you, Jesus, 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 Lord, I'm so grateful, that name, things have to change, at the mention of your name, it has to your name truly is power and it is healing and it is life lord it truly brings life nothing else matters but you lord <laughs> you're powerful and break every stronghold and yet you you let us call you ours <laughs> you're such a good father you're just so awesome you are so holy you are so worthy of all of our praise this morning each and every day, Lord, we cry to you that you are holy and that you are worthy. But there's something about your name, Lord. Just by the name of Jesus, so many things change, Lord. Mountains move. Chains break. There's healing. There is power in that name. We don't have to say anything else but your name, Lord. <laughs> just so grateful for the name of Jesus and for what you've done for us. So Lord, as we get ready to receive your word this morning, I pray that we would come with open hearts, that the word would take root down deep, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we would be doers of the word. Let us not leave here the same, but to be changed by you, Lord, because we need you. We need you and want to be the hands and feet of Christ. That's all that matters, Lord. We love you. We give it all to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Church, can you give him a hand clap of praise? He's so worthy, amen. He's so worthy. He's so good. Well, church, we are so glad that you could be here this morning. Will you take a few seconds to greet one another, and we'll get started with the sermon video soon.
church family. Our family is having a great time on this getaway. It's been so just healing and restoring for our family. The kids are getting along so well and we miss you so much. And if you're a guest this morning, we want to welcome you to Lakeview and ask you to take a moment to fill out a connection card. And if you'll place those cards in the offering boxes after service, we'd be so happy to connect with you and to welcome you to our church family. And we also have several options to give here at Lakeview. You can give online at lakeviewpeople.com slash give, or you can use our mobile app. Uh, the text to give number will be on the screen. And finally, I want to invite everybody to participate in our 21 days of prayer. It's going to be August 4th through the 24th. You can learn more about it and put prayer requests in at lakeviewpeople.com slash prayer. Man, our family is just having the best time and just building strong relationships. And we can't wait to see you again in a few weeks. Uh, I want you to join me in welcoming Pastor Mark as he brings part seven of our summer series from the book of James entitled The Blueprint for Faith. Let's get ready to hear from God's word. We love you. We'll see you soon. Well, I just want to know how many think we need to pray for that family. Hallelujah. They need some prayer. Father, we come to you in Jesus' name, and we just give you thanks for our pastor, for his family. Lord, I pray, as he mentioned, that they would just be restored, that they would be refreshed, that they would uh, uh, learn new things about one another, Father. And we give you thanks even now as they're having opportunity to spend some time on the beach. Uh, just let them enjoy their time. And uh, thank God that when they come back, they'll be refreshed. Our pastor will have renewed vision. And I thank you that you are even making impartations even now in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Let's give a hand for our pastor. Amen. <laughs> Tell them how much we love them. And we do. And so I want to, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, mention um, something that happened last night, very, very tragic thing that happened in Butler, Pennsylvania, where uh, former, uh, former President Trump was at a rally. Many of you probably already know that this, that there was a shooting. Uh, the shooting involved uh, killing a woman and injuring a couple of other people besides injuring our president, our former president. And um, so, you know, when we think about that, we think, well, that sure could have been really a lot more tragic. But if you were the woman who passed away, her family probably thinks that's very, very tragic. And so we want to pray for that family, for those who are recovering. We want to pray for them as well. We absolutely want to pray for President, uh, former President Trump. But you know what? We don't want to just focus there. The Bible tells us, Paul told Timothy to be praying for those who are in authority. Why? Pray for our, our, our national leaders, for those who are in authority, that we might lead a quiet and peaceable life. So see, when there's turmoil in, in that arena, there's turmoil in the world. And the enemy wants turmoil. He wants to stir it up. Now, so many people have so many different um, uh, conspiracies as about who might have done it and what might have happened. The fact of the matter is what we need to do is we need to go to the Lord. And so I'm going to ask you to pray with me today as we go to the Lord. Father, we give you thanks so much. We're thankful that we live in the United States of America. We thank you that this is truly the, the, the most free country in the world. And we live in freedom. But Lord, there are those that want to inhibit that. <laughs> and we know Satan wants to inhibit that. It's because right here from this, from our shores have gone out more missionaries into the world than any other, t any other place from any other place in the world. Everything's been 
affected. Our entire globe has been affected by the positive things that have come out of the United States. And the enemy wants to tear that down. And so right now, Satan, I adjure you in Jesus' name to take your hands off of our country, to take your hands off of our processes, our systems. And in the name of Jesus, we, put, we believe peace will reign in the United States. Father, raise up men and women of God to run in these positions from the national level to the local level that we might serve you in peace. And we give you thanks for it now. In Jesus' name, everybody said amen. amen. Praise the Lord. Um, God is good. How many know our God is good? And, and I really believe that the hand of protection was upon our, our former president in the fact that he did, he did not go out. Think of what that would have been like. Think about what we would be thinking about today had that happened. And so I have a question for you today. As we continue on our blueprint for faith, today we're talking about finding God's will. How many have ever said, I want to find God's will for my life? God, just tell me your will. I want to know the plan. What's the plan, Lord? Anybody ever said that? I've said that. Matter of fact, I remember 1977. I've shared this before. 1977, I lived in Muncie, Indiana. Anybody ever been there? Good, good. I've been there. I'm born there. Hallelujah. But I was there in 1977. I was at Muncie Central High School. I was walking home. Uh, as I walked home from school every day, I would stop by our church and I would take a minute to pray. And that, that day I came down and it would have been to my left, your right, on the stage there. Uh, there were steps just like this, but it ended at the wall. The steps ended at the wall. And right there at the wall was a uh, uh, stained glass, very similar to these stained glass, right there. And I bowed down at that altar and prayed. Not always a long time, sometimes 10 minutes, sometimes 15 minutes, sometimes an hour, but it just depended. I'd take my Bible in there, and I'd sit down, I'd read my Bible, and I'd pray. And one day, I heard the Lord ask this question. I was seeking him about his will for my life, and I heard him ask this question, will you work for me? And I thought that meant he wanted me to go into vocational ministry. Now, vocational ministry, <laughs> there's a joke that goes with that. I'm going to tell a joke. I'm sure hoping you'll laugh. <laughs> what is vocational ministry? See, everybody's called to full-time ministry. How I many of this isn't a joke? Everybody's called to full-time ministry. We're all called to full-time ministry. We're all called full-time to live for Jesus Christ. We're not called to be living for Jesus on Sunday and live like the devil the rest of the week. I've heard a few country songs that say that we, we party on Friday night and pray in church on Sunday morning. That ought not be so of the church. Come on. And so, uh, uh, but vocational ministry means that uh, <laughs> you're paid to be good. <laughs> you got to be good because they're paying you, right? If you're in uh, just uh, uh, not vocational ministry, but ministry every day, you just get to be good for nothing. <laughs> I thought it was a joke. It's one of them old preacher jokes, and you know, sometimes old preacher jokes aren't funny. But anyway, truly, I want you to know this, God has a purpose for your life. How many believe that? You wouldn't be here if you didn't believe God had a purpose for your life. You wouldn't be here if you didn't believe God had a plan for your life. That, that there wasn't something that you were to be doing with your life. You would not be here if you didn't believe that. If you're here and you don't believe that, I hope by the time we leave here, you have a new uh, perspective perspective on how God wants you to live your life. See, I want you to know there are two types of purposes. Two types. There's life-defining purposes and there's life-encompassing purpose. Our life-defining purpose, life-encompassing uh, purpose. Um, anybody ever heard of a man named Billy Graham? Yes. Just a few of you. All right, good. He's pretty well known. When we think about our life-defining purpose, our life-defining purpose is what they say about you at your funeral. 
It's the one thing that sticks out that everybody says, but he did this or she was that. This happened and, and, and in that moment, they took control and they, they did what they needed to do to make things happen. There was a man named Billy Graham in 1934. <laughs> I asked in the first service if anybody was around in 1934. Did you know I, nobody said yes, so I'm, I'm concerned about that. Uh, anybody here uh, around in 1934? See, my mom was born in 36. She just, Carol, these, you were here in 1934. Let's give, Carol, just your sister was, let's give her a big hand, amen? <laughs> Carol always reminds me that she's the younger sister, right? Isn't that right, Carol? That's right. All right. And so uh, in 1934, Billy Graham attended a revival meeting. He was a young man in his teenage, teenage years. He attended a revival meeting. In the revival meeting, the, the preacher there was the evangelist Mordecai Ham. And after Mordecai Ham preached, uh, Billy Graham uh, responded to the altar call, came to the altar and received Christ as personal Lord and Savior. Now that's a pretty awesome thing. To think I was the guy who did the preaching the day Billy Graham, Billy Graham gave his life to the Lord. It was a life-defining moment. But you know what? In the moment, nobody knew. Nobody knew that in the moment. Why? Because Billy Graham had to honor God. Billy Graham had to do what God called him to do. Billy Graham had to find his life purpose and fulfill his life purpose before the life-defining purpose of Mordecai Ham could be recognized. And today we say Mordecai Ham is the guy who led Billy Graham to the Lord. You know what? There's things that are happening each and every day in your day that seem status quo. You know what I'm saying? It just seems like this is what I do every day. But if you do what God called you to do every day, there will be that time that there's going to be that life-defining purpose that is established in your life. For many, a life-defining purpose is born from difficulty. It's born out of difficulty. Have you ever heard the term, uh, um, the, the phrase that said, uh, you, you were here for a, uh, how does it go with Esther? You were born for such a time as this. You were born for such a time as this. That's Esther. We remember that. She was born for one thing. And what was that one thing? That one thing that uh, Esther was born for was to save her nation. That was her defining moment. That was her defining purpose. But each and every day she did what she, she drew close to her mother-in-law. She, she took on our God as her God. And she began to serve our God each and every day. And in serving her God each and every day, when her defining moment came, she was ready. You know, she could have lost her life for doing what she did. The, the, she went before the, the, the king and, and without, without an appointment, without a, a, a being requested to come before him. She did that because God told her to do it. And so she did it. And when she did it, she saved her people. See, it's surprise, sometimes we're surprised when God moves, especially in these defining moments. We're surprised when he moves. It seems for us that it happens suddenly. I like the suddenlies of God. How many like the suddenlies of God? How many know the suddenlies of God are not sudden to him? He never gets caught off guard. He's already working on the answer before you even know there's a problem. If you're serving him each and every day. Our life encompassing purpose God planted, God plants people. Did you know you are where you are on purpose by, de by God's design? You live here where you live by God's design. I know that's a fact. I know it's true. You live in the time and space, in, in this time-space continuum. You live right here, and you were born when you were born on purpose. You were placed in the family you were placed in on purpose. The Bible says this in Acts 17, 26, reading out of the, and this isn't in your notes, but you can take that down, Acts 17, 26, and 28, uh, out of the New Century Version. It says, God began by making one person, 
And from him came all the different people who live everywhere in the world. Notice what it said. God decided exactly when and where they must live. You live here on purpose. You live here by God's design. Verse 28 goes on to say, and by his power, we sang about his power, by his power we live and move and exist. And so you are in the place that you're supposed to be. Quit looking for the place to go. You're there. And while you're there, if you will embrace being there, that's when you can allow God's power to begin to flow through you. And that way you will live and move and have your being. You will fulfill your purpose. Like Mordecai Ham, if you consistently walk in your life-encompassing purpose, he was called to be an evangelist. He went out and did what an evangelist does. And if you, like him, walk consistently in that life-encompassing purpose, you will not miss your appointment with your life-defining moment. So we must walk in the will of God every day. So the question remains... What is the will of God for you? What is the will of God for you? James 4, and that's where we're starting today. James 4 is, is divided into three segments. And those three segments describe how we can find God's will for our life. And in that very first segment, one thing I want you to see, and you can write this down. It's in your notes, actually. You can fill this one in. Acknowledge... You are to acknowledge the fact that you need some help. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, you need some help. Come on, we all need some help, don't we? And not only just some help, we need God's help. How many believe we need God's help? We do. Sometimes we can look in the mirror and we know exactly that we need God's help. And then remember this, James is a pastor. And so he's writing to a church that was scattered, but he's writing to a church. And in James chapter 4 verse 1, he says this. He writes this. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but do not have, and so you just kill. Are you kidding me? Do you know who he's writing to? He's writing to the church. And he wrote to this church first and said, you want something and you can't have it. So what are you going to do? You're just going to kill somebody. Come on, somebody. How many think that's a messed up church? That's messed up. You covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. Messed up. How many have ever heard uh, uh, in, in some in some churches, not this church, but in some churches, when you have board meetings, fights erupt. I heard of a church that every time they were going to have their annual business meeting, they called the sheriff's department. <laughs> and the sheriff sat in on their annual business meeting. Do you think that was a life-giving church? That church sucked the life right out of you, I'll bet you. Huh? I want to I be a part of a life-giving church. What is a life-giving church? It's a church that doesn't suck the life out of you. That's what a life-giving church is. It's one that gives you something, doesn't take something from you. So James describes a church that was quarreling and fighting, even killing one another. Obviously, they didn't listen to my message from last week, right? Or read James chapter 3. Because in James chapter 3, it said to be wise, we're going to do what? We're going to follow godly principles. We're going to act with godly motives. And we are intent on serving godly purposes. But no, they were doing just the exact opposite. And how many know there are times we do exactly the opposite of what God asks us to do? We do. We do. And I don't know if it's creep. You know what I mean? We talked about creep last time, last week. But you can kind of creep away from the things of God. You kind of take, you know what? You can take one step and it'll get you going the wrong way. You know, if you think about it, one degree off. If you've charted a course on, uh, on your airplane and you're one degree off, 
you know, at 10 miles, that's probably not a big deal. But at 150 miles, it's become a pretty big deal. And what, that's what happens to us. We, we begin to think more of ourselves. We think about ourselves more. Well, I want. I need. Well, look at them. And, and then all of a sudden, we're not walking in line with the word of God. What do we say? We say things like, I want more money. I want more status. They should know who I am around here. I need more respect. They should respect me. Or more affection. And what does all of that lead to? Quarrels, fights, and listen, the killing of relationships. Not only the killing of relationships, but the killing of your reputation. We begin to covet and we begin to compare. And what does covetousness and comparison do? It sucks the life right out of you. It just sucks the life out of you. In James chapter 4 verse 2, he's, he goes on to say, you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. So what does that mean? If you want something, ask God for it. But then notice what he said, but even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are wrong. You, o you want only what will give you pleasure. How many know we are a pleasure-seeking society? We've become a pleasure-seeking society. Uh, everything we do is all about how is it going to please me? And we're not looking to the needs of other people. We're not caring about those other people that are even in our own personal families and in our personal life. We love the things of the world over the things of God. Come on. How many are excited you came to church this morning? You said, I could have stayed home and got beat up. No, I'm not beating you up. I'm just saying what the Bible says. We, none of us, are without, I don't, I'm, not, I'm not a big blame person, you know, but none of us are really without fault. We all, at some time or another, we want the things that the world offers more than the things of God. And so that's what we pursue. We pursue it. And it causes us to quarrel and argue and fuss. We want what's going to hurt us, not what's going to help us. Now, how many know God loves you? Just like, a, just like you as a parent with your child, you love your child too much to give them something that's going to hurt them. Or you don't love them at all and you give them something that hurts them. Come on. We do, but God loves you too much to let you have everything you want. He just does. He just loves you too much to let you have everything you want. As a matter of fact, if we persist in pursuing our own way, what happens is that God many times will lift his grace off of us. And we look at that and we say, no, God would never lift his grace off of us. I'm not talking about his saving grace. I'm talking about his grace for living. You're saved, but his hand is off you for a moment. Why? Because I'm pursuing what I want, just what I want. And you know what? If you pursue just what you want, you'll get things you never wanted. He lifts his grace. As a matter of fact, we, we ask him, open this door. And he's like, no, I'm not opening that door. I had a friend one time. He was in the military and he wanted a particular job. And it was one of those kind of things that he could actually apply for. And so he was like, I want that job. I want that job. And so he, he kind of lobbied some superiors to, to write letters for him and things like that. But nobody would. Nobody would. Finally, one of his superior officers just said to him, look, you can't do that job. You want it. You want it for the prestige. You want it for the increase in, in uh, revenue uh, or, or income. You want it for all the wrong reasons. And I won't sign off on that. And he didn't get it. And later on, as he grew older, he recited that very instance as it was an, instant that, an instance that caused him to grow as a person. See, God wants you to grow. And he's not just going to give you everything you want. He can't do that. As a matter of fact, that sometimes it seems 
like God's against you. But I went to church and they said, God's for me. How many know that in being for you, God at times can be against you. He can oppose you. That's scriptural. And that's the will of God. How do we know? James 4, 6 says, He gives grace generously. But as the scriptures say, God opposes the proud. If we're going to persist in pride, if we're going to persist in wanting our way, we are setting ourselves up at opposition against God. I don't want to be in opposition against God because I think he wins that battle. You know what I'm saying? When I'm opposed against God, I know he's going to win. I'm not winning that. So I need to get my life right. So notice what he says. God opposes the proud, but what does he do? He gives grace to the humble. Well, that's where I want to be. I want to be the humble. If he gives grace to the humble and he gives grace generously, then I just need to humble myself and I'll have generous grace from God in my life. Humble myself how? What do I do? I say to him, I need your help. I need your help. I need your help, God. I can't do this all on my own. There are things that you've taught me, things that I've learned that I know how to do things, but sometimes what I've learned keeps me from doing what God wants me to do. And I need to set that aside and obey his voice. I need your help, God. In James 4, 8, he says, how do we, how do we humble ourselves? Here's how we do it. I need you, God. I come close to God. And when you move close to God, what will God do? He will move close to you. I want God close to me. How do I get God close to me? How do I humble myself, God? I move towards him. I've got to move towards him. So many of us are waiting on him to do something for us. You're, you're going to be waiting. Hello? You're going to be waiting. I'm waiting on God to do this. No. Move towards him. Move towards him. Don't just, when, when, when the Bible says they waited on the Lord, they ministered to him and waited upon him and the Holy Spirit said, waiting on the Lord is, pa- is not passive. Waiting on the Lord is something we do positively. We, we, we uh, start that and we go there. Amen. And so I think it's so important for us to know that. So James 4, 8 and 4, 10 says, come close to God and God will come close to you. Wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts. Why? For your loyalty is divided. How is it divided? Between God and the world. When our loyalty is divided between God and the world. I want to serve God, but I want to do what I want to do. I want to serve God, but I want to do this. I want to serve God, but I want to do that. We said last week about drawing lines in the sand and that drawing those lines in the sand, they may come incrementally for you, but when it's time to draw on the line in the sand and not go past it, do it because that's God guiding you and that's him pouring out his grace generously so that you can act on it. So God gives grace generously. He opposes the proud. He gives grace to the humble. How do I humble myself? Uh, James 4, 7. I missed that one, but I want to read that one for you. It says, give yourself completely to God. Give yourself completely to God. And say to him, I need your help every day. Come close to him. God will come close to you. Wash your hands. Purify your hearts. Don't let your heart be divided Pure heart means to be whole. Remember, have a whole heart. Have your, it's not divided, but it's wholly serving God. And it's not divided between the God and the world. And so I humble myself. And what does he do? He lifts me up in honor. He lifts me up. Now listen, God doesn't take pleasure in lifting his grace from you. And I don't want you to hear that. But if your loyalty is divided and your heart's not pure, uh, he will. He will. But humility causes God not to just uh, restore his relationship with us. When we become humble, we're not just restored to God, but he pours out his grace and he lifts us up. How many believe that Jesus knew what his purpose was? 
John 10.10 tells us. John 10.10 is not in your notes, but jot it down there. Jesus reveals his mission. He reveals his purpose when he said, I am come. I came. Here's the purpose I came. I came that you, all of you, all of us might have life and have it more abundantly. Not just abundantly. Another translation says completely. So here it is. If I give my life to him completely, he will give all of him to me completely. What did he say? If I will come near him, he will come near to me. If I will give him my whole heart, he will give me his whole heart. Amen. I have to take that first move. And we say, well, why doesn't God take the first move? Well, he did making it available to him, to us. So John 10, 10, I love that scripture. I am come that you might have life and have it more abundantly, completely, or to the full. This is God's will concerning you. And it happens to those who humble themselves. So in humility, it's kind of a, uh, you've probably heard this before. If you're going to be humble, humility is you go up by going down. You go up by going down. We could all benefit. How many believe we could all benefit from a kind of a Texas-sized dose of humility in our life? I think we all could. I think we all could. Either we can do it for ourselves, right? Or God will do it for you. Now, I remember hearing a preacher one time said, yeah, God will just knock you down. He'll just pound on you until you get to the bottom of the barrel and you're looking up and finally you can say, I need the Lord. I don't think that's the way it works. I think the way it works is you won't humble yourself before him. He lifts his hand. You do the pounding. You take yourself to the bottom. Don't do that. You don't have to. I think like Bob Newhart one time said, just stop it. <laughs> Some of you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> just stop it. Just stop it. Stop that and honor the Lord. Humility is a way, uh, the way up is down, but we should do it for ourselves. How do we do it? It's God's will that we acknowledge Jesus as our Savior and Lord and confess our need for his help. I need your help, God. Number two. The will of God. The second thing James talks about. Believe the best about everybody you meet. Amen. Believe the best about everybody you meet. How many are so excited that you came to church today? Amen. Believe the best. You know what? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 13 that love believes the best of everyone. So when you walk in love, you do believe the best of everyone. But you know what will happen? If I believe the best of everybody, I'm going to get burnt. You know what? You might get burnt sometime. But let me say this. You're not going to get burnt as often as you're wrong about what you believe concerning people that you meet. Right. See, we have all these criteria by which we judge people the moment we meet them. And a lot of times we miss good, wholesome relationships in our life just because we say, well, that person doesn't check this box, this box, or this box. And in reality... There's somebody God's bringing into your life. Think the best about them. You know what? Sometime you might get burnt. Sometime uh, that giving the best. But how many know Jesus gave his best when nobody wanted him? Nobody wanted him and he gave his best. And the potential reward outweighs the risk. So believe the best. Well, why would I want to believe the best? Three reasons. Number one, it's not your responsibility to judge other people. Right. Not mine, not yours, not ours. We don't judge others. Let me tell you what stress is. Anybody ever walk in stress? <laughs> stress is this, is the inevitable result of taking responsibility in an area you have no authority. You want me to say that again? Stress is the inevitable result of taking responsibility in an area you have no authority. Have you ever been given responsibilities by a boss 
who then will not give you the authority to do the, the thing he's holding you responsible for? That happens a lot. It happens a lot. They say, I want you to do this, and you're responsible to get that done, but then to have the authority to actually go do it, they won't want to release that. Then you're frustrated. It's a very frustrating thing. Well, that's the thing. You're not anybody's ju judge. So it becomes very stressful to you to judge other people, always being living in a judgmental life. But listen, you don't have the responsibility or authority to judge other people, but there are some exceptions. If you're an elected judge, you work for God. If you're in law enforcement, you work for God. If you are responsible for church discipline, you work for God. And if you're a parent, you work for God. You are responsible. To judge what's going on in your kids' lives. And to minister to those needs. And sometimes, you know, that's not an easy thing. You have responsibility to judge what's going on. James 4, 11 and 12 says this. Don't speak evil of each other, dear brothers and sisters. So who's he talking to again? The church. If you have to say it, then that means it was going on. Right? He would have never had to say it had it not been going on. So somebody was talking evil of somebody else. And he said, don't talk evil uh, of each other, dear brothers and sisters. Then he said this, God alone who gave the law is the judge. He alone has the power to save or destroy. So what right do I have to judge, or what right do you have to judge your neighbor? Paul said it this way, who are you to judge another man's servant? Who are you to judge another man's servant? So uh, here's my suggestion. If you find yourself being judgmental, you need to resign as the general manager of the universe. You just need to tender your resignation now. I do too. If that was me, I need to tender my resignation. I'm not the judge of the universe. See, God is love. And his responsibility as a God of love is to correct us, to guide us, and to discipline us. Our responsibility, our only responsibility, is to walk in love. Owe no man anything but to love him, is what the Bible says. I'm to owe no man anything but to love him. So my responsibility is to love you. And if you have issues, if you've got something going on in your life, I will point you to where you can get some help. Come on, somebody. Because I know where the help, my help comes from. So uh, he said, don't speak evil. So when you, uh, uh, the point number two, the second reason that you want to speak the best about everybody you meet is when you judge others, <laughs> you're wrong most of the time. You know what I mean? We're wrong most of the time when we judge other people. We need to believe the best. First Corinthians 4, 5 says this in the message, paraphrase, it says, so don't get ahead of the master and jump to conclusions with your judgments before all the evidence is in. How many uh, judge a matter before you hear the whole thing? It's really easy to do. We jump to conclusions. You can see it on Facebook and Instagram all the time. There are people who know exactly what happened in Butler, Pennsylvania. Just ask them. They weren't there, but they know. You follow what I'm saying? They know. They, they're, they're, they're jumping to conclusions. They're all over the airwaves. And when he comes, it says, he will bring out in the open and place in evidence, I like that, all kinds of things that we've never even dreamed of. There are things going on in people's lives. We judge them. That's where we say, again, I can't believe they act that way, but once we, the evidence comes, we can't believe they don't act more that way. He's going to reveal inner motives and purposes in prayers. Only then will any one of us get to hear, well done from God. <clears throat> How many want to hear that? Well done. I want to hear it from God. Number three, or, or, or the third thing down there, the third reason that you want to be, uh, uh, believe the best about everybody is when you believe the best, it allows you to engage in what's called the law of reciprocity. The law of reciprocity. It's a law that God engages in. We've already talked about it. When you draw near to him, what will he do? Draw near to you. He's, he reciprocates your action. Uh, 
And so if you believe the best of other, other people, you need to engage in the law of reciprocity. What, is it, what does that mean? What you do for someone, they will do for you. That sounds a little bit like the golden rule. The golden rule says, do unto others what you want them to do unto you. Right? And so if you get to a door, anybody ever been to Coles right here in the great uh, city of Wichita Falls? Coles. They're having a sale, y'all. Just want you to know. And so you walk through that front door, right? And then there's another door you got to walk through to get into the store. Y'all been to stores like that? There's two doors. Lowe's has it like that. It's for weather and to keep the air conditioning regulated and all that. I guarantee you've done this. You walk up to the door. Somebody's behind you. You grab the door. After you. And they'll say, well, thank you. And what's, what are they going to do? They'll grab that other door and open it and say, let me return the favor. Right? Has that ever happened to you? It's happened to me tons of times. And I've done it tons of times. Where I've opened a door for someone. That's the law of reciprocation. And the thing about it is, people have an innate tendency to reciprocate for kind acts. It's just within us to reciprocate for that. There are givers and takers. We know that. They're the fringe. Those that give everything away, they'll give everything away. And those that'll take everything from you and never, never reciprocate. There's two fringes. But most people fall in this area uh, where they will honor you. Well, listen to what Luke says. Jesus said this. I think Jesus already knew this. Do not judge others. And... You will not be judged. Do not condemn others. And it will not come back against you. Forgive others. And you will be forgiven. Give. And you will receive. Your gift will be returned to you in full. Pressed down. Shaken together. To make room for more. Running over and poured into your lap. The amount that you give. Here it is you guys. The amount that you give will determine the amount you get back. That is the law of reciprocity or reciprocation. It's a law. The amount you give will determine what comes back to you. It's a boomerang effect. But how many know the converse is true? That if you're going to be condemning or critical of others, it comes back to you. Some of the most judgmental people, man, you know, they're, they're judgmental of everybody and everybody's judgmental of them. And they can't get a break. <laughs> you know what I mean? Nobody likes me. Well, you don't like anybody. <laughs> so it's amazing how that works. So here's what I want you to do because we're better than that. Why? Because Jesus is on the inside of us. That's why we're better than that. Not because we're better than them, but we're better than we used to be. Remember? We are better. Why? So we can sow good seed and believe the best of other people. And when we're not judgmental, it will come back to us. I think that's important. So believe the best about everybody you meet. Number three, the will of God. We're going to close with this. This is really important. Matter of fact, of all the three points, I think it's the most important. In everything that you do, consult with God before you do anything. Consult with him. Has anybody here, I'm going to ask this question. You did, you did something, you made a decision that looked good to you. It looked good on the front side. It looked like a good decision. But in the midst of making that decision and walking it out, circumstances kind of changed. And you realized, wait a minute. I regret doing that. I regret doing that. You know, God doesn't want you to live with regrets. Can you imagine hell, what hell's going to be like? I'm not going to be there. But hell's going to, uh, the, the worst thing to me about hell is living in eternal regret. Especially if you knew you had a chance to accept Christ and you did it. And you go to hell and you're living in that regret. That would be terrible. But 
There are people that have done these kinds of things. Anybody in here have an Apple phone? Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Thank you. Raise your hand if you have an Apple phone. Raise your hand real high. What other phone is there? <laughs> Who started Apple anyway? Anybody know? Who? Steve Jobs. Was Steve Jobs the only one who started Apple? No, who else was with him? Steve Wozniak. Steve Wozniak was with him. So we have Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. But you know there are three people that founded Apple? You probably don't even know the third guy's name. His name is Rob Wayne. Rob Wayne. Rob Wayne was an acquaintance of both Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak when they were working in their garage. They're working in their garage on something that is going to be re revolutionize the world, right? And so they need about another $1,500. And so they say to uh, um, Ronald, they say, Ronald, if you'll give us $1,500, we'll give you 10% stake in our company. He's like, hey, okay, I can do that. So he gave him $1,500. About three weeks later, he got what's called cold feet. And he wanted his money back. Well, they gave him his money back and they gave him $800. He got a 23 uh, he cashed out for $2,300, an $800 increase on his investment for three weeks. How many would take that? That's pretty good, isn't it? That's pretty good. Except if he hadn't have done that and just let it ride, right? Let it ride. If he'd have just let it ride, he'd be worth $50 billion. $50 billion. But he got cold feet. How many think he might just maybe regret that decision? Timing is everything. <laughs> James 4, 13 through 15 says this, and now I have a word for, for you who brashly announce today at the latest tomorrow, we're off to such and such a city for a year. And we're going to start a business and we're going to make a lot of money. You don't know the first thing about tomorrow. You're nothing but a wisp of fog catching a brief bit of sun before disappearing. Instead, make it a habit to say, if the master wills, what's your will, God? If the master wills, and we're still alive, We'll do this or that. What is he doing? They're trying to consult God as to what they should do. In any manner then, in any, any matter that we face, any matter. Now listen to me, this is really important because there are people from this side of the room all the way over to this side of the room that you're making decisions. And there's some very, very important decisions in your life to be made. The final question on any matter is this. Will this honor God? Will this decision honor God? Like in your money decisions. A lot of people, their decisions is, well, this, I'm going to make this decision because it's going to make us more money. No. Will it honor God? Or I got to relocate. I need to move. I'm not, I'm not doing well here. I need to move. We, we need to change the scenery. This will make me happy. Will it make you happy? Or will it honor God? Is what you're doing honoring God? Is the decision you're making honoring God? Like in our fashion decisions. So I wore these britches today because I thought it'd make me look sexy. <laughs> Not really. I was trying to honor God and, and save you the embarrassment of having to see these legs, right? But how many believe, like I told you last week, Dana and I went to the, to the beach. There are a lot of people that should not be wearing some things. Just saying. You have to turn your head. You're like, really? You looked in the mirror and thought that looked good. Sorry, I wasn't judgmental in that area. 
But there are some fashion decisions we just need to say, is what I'm wearing honoring God? Is what I'm wearing honoring God? I want to share, uh, I want you to know, number one, God's not a party pooper. He doesn't want to poop on your party. He wants what's best for you because he loves you. And he can see what you cannot see. I guarantee you, if Ronald Wayne could have seen what he could not see, he never would have asked for his money back. And it's the same. God sees things, and so we need to trust him and consult him with our decisions. And not in your notes, Proverbs 3, 5, and 7. It should be on the screen. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not depend on your own understanding. Seek him, his will in all you do. The will of God is to seek his will in all you do. And he will show you which path to take. That's a promise. He will show you. Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord. Turn away from evil. Jesus said something very, very similar. Matthew 6, 31 and 33. Don't worry about these things. Saying, what will I eat? What will I drink? What will I wear? These things dominate the thoughts of an unbeliever. So don't act like an unbeliever. But your heavenly father already knows your needs. What are we supposed to do? Seek the kingdom of God above all else. You've heard it said it this way. Seek first the kingdom of God and its righteousness. Or why am I seeking its righteousness? So that I'll live righteously. And what will happen? God will give you everything you need. If you'll just honor him. Let's stand this morning. What if we did this? What if we admitted our need for him? What if we believe the best about everyone? What if we, in every decision, consulted God? What do you think our life would look like? What would our life look like? Can you answer that? It'd be a life of what God would call success. Not what the world might call, but what God would call. How do you think our church would look? Further, how do you think your family would look if everyone in your family admitted they had a need for God? You know, there are people in here today that have family members that are not saved. They have family members that don't know Christ. And, and if you'd ask them, I'll bet you they would say, man, I just want my family members to know Christ. I don't want to go to heaven without them. I wouldn't say there's a person in here that wants to go to heaven without your family. I don't want to go to heaven without mine. But we need help. Because so many times, we think judging them for their actions is going to lead them to the Lord. Can I tell you, it's not going to work. I had a man in first service came to me afterwards. Only thing on his mind is his daughter. Let's think about that just for a minute. I want you to close your eyes. I want you to think about your family. How can I model what they need? Number one, I can admit, Lord, I need you. Let's say that. Say, Lord, I need you. I need your help. Let's make that commitment, Lord. I will believe the best of everyone. And Lord, I will consult you in every decision. You know, this thought just came to me. Sometimes we consult people about our decisions just trying to get agreement. But when you consult God, you need to have an open heart because he might not agree with what you think. And it's not submission, it's not humility till you have to do what you don't want to do. So I'm asking you to humble your heart before him. If there's anybody in here today, you'd say, I've never accepted Christ. I want God in my corner. I want God in my life. And I want to go to heaven. If that's you, would you raise your hand? I want to pray for you today. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? 
Anybody else? Let me pray for those two right now. Father, I thank you very much. I want you to pray this prayer with me. Say, Father, I thank you. Everybody, pray it with me. Father, I thank you that you sent Jesus to die for me. And I confess him as my Lord and Savior today. I believe that you raised him from the dead and that he is now my Savior. Jesus, come into my heart. Make me whole. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer from your heart, you're saved today. Let's give those folks a hand, amen. If you prayed that prayer today, please take one of our connection cards and just fill it out on the back. Let us know. Next week is Baptism Sunday. And if you've never been baptized and you want to be baptized, please go to our website. It's lakeviewpeople.com slash baptism. When you go there, you can register to be baptized. Somebody will contact you this week and we'll make sure you're baptized next Sunday. Don't you think that's awesome? Amen. I'm going to uh, turn it over to Ms. Hannah right now. I'm going to ask the prayer team and the band to come down. All right? The prayer team and the band, uh, the worship team, sorry. I want my band to come down. No. <laughs> we want the prayer team to come down. If you have need for personal prayer today, we have our prayer team members that are in the uh, altar here. If you want to come down, they're happy to pray with you. Amen. Hannah? Well, church, isn't God good? His word is good. Amen. Amen. Let me pray for you, and then we'll get you out of here dismissed this Sunday. Lord, we thank you so much for your word. Lord, I pray that by the power of the Holy Spirit, we would be doers of the word as we leave here. Lord, help us to go forth to be lights for you, to be the hands and feet of Jesus. God, I pray that you would go with my church family, protect them, watch them, keep them, bless them. And Lord, we just love you and give this day to you this morning in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Church, thank you for being here. You're dismissed. Have a wonderful rest of your Sunday. We'll see you next week.